We're back and there's plenty to talk about, from painting our streets to dissecting our metro's top political stories. Plus, there's no end to the violence. What I saw last night, I thought I was looking at Baghdad. Also this half hour, this week marks six months since the first COVID case was reported in our metro. We have a status report on where we're at and where we're headed. Week in Review is made possible through the generous support of Dave and Jamie Cummings, Bob and Marlies Gorley, Haas and Wilkerson Insurance, the Courtney S. Turner Charitable Trust, John H. Mize and Bank of America N.A. co-trustees, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Hello, I'm Nick Haynes. It is good to be back with you. Thanks for your kind notes and messages worrying about where we had been. We, of course, were in our membership drive, which helps pay the bills around here. So this week, two weeks in review for the price of one. Working extra hard to make that happen is KCUR City Hall reporter Lisa Rodriguez, the managing editor of the Call newspaper Eric Wesson from your Kansas City star Dave Helling, and tracking the news from behind a microphone at KCMO Talk Radio, Pete Mundo. Over the weekend, a slew of streets across our city were shut down to make way for artists and hundreds of volunteers to paint Black Lives Matter murals directly onto the roadways. The USA Today newspaper described it as the largest project of its kind in the country. What has been the reaction, Eric Wesson? Well, it's been a positive reaction uh, throughout the urban core. Uh, some businesses on 31st Street had an issue with it being in front of their, their buildings. They thought it was kind of divisive. Uh, but overall, it's been... You know, it's been well received throughout 18th Street, and I know the one on 63rd Street has gotten grave reviews as well. I guess my question is, okay, so now does this open the door for Blue Lives Matter, Short People's Lives Matter? So what is the ultimate goal in being able to do this? Are the policemen's wives going to want to paint Blue Lives Matters in front of all the police stations? So I think it's kind of opened the door for the message to get diluted. Lisa, there were efforts, though, at City Hall. There was a push by some citizens to ask for Blue Lives Matter um, art to be painted onto the streets. What happened to that? I, I don't think that that currently, to my knowledge, is, is moving forward right now. Um, the city council's been off for a couple of weeks. Um, if, if it does get brought to the city council formally, um, they'll take a vote on it. But I think it's also important to keep in mind when we talk about possibly doing a Blue Lives Matter memorial is that um, in many ways we do memorialize uh, blue lives in big grand ways across the city. Not only do we have physical memorials, but when an officer gets uh, killed in the line of duty, we fly flags at half mast. We have big public processionals and make big displays of this. So, so we do memorialize blue lives, you know, police officers' lives in big ways already. We can't forget, Dave Helling, that in other cities where they have had Black Lives Matter murals, they were vandalized and defaced. No evidence of that here? To my knowledge, not yet. Now, these have been uh, more controversial maybe than a lot of people know, not just from adjacent business owners, but I do think there is some pushback from people who worry, uh, as Eric suggests, not only about Blue Lives Matter or other uh, slogans that you might paint on the streets, but there's a whole First Amendment issue that's going to come up pretty quickly, one assumes, because once you start painting on the streets with any kind of message, other people will come forward and say, how, how come I can't paint on my street? I think X matters, and I have a First Amendment right to do so, and the precedent has been set. So I do think this can turn out to be a little messier than a lot of people expect. But no tax money was spent on this, Pete Mundo. So should the public have any concerns about this artwork when it's being paid for by private donations? Uh, yeah, no, no taxpayer money used. I think a part of this, too, is, is the sentiment of, of the murals. Is it, is it uh, for that expression, which, of course, you know, every reasonable person agrees, yes, black lives do matter, or is it showing support with the organization itself? And that's where a lot of people would say, uh, hey, I believe in that phrase. I don't agree with the organization, and it's not clear to me what exactly that mural is. I guess everybody can interpret it their own way, but I think that's a part of this, too, where, where there's some reason for legitimate pushback. 
Eric, this is only the beginning of this project, though. There is the second stage, which is going to be painting murals on walls, and the third stage, creating a blueprint for others to add murals to their own neighborhood streets. So what does that mean? Does that mean anyone will be able to paint what they want on the street? I, I believe so. If if we has if they if the city hall has set a precedence and a standard to do it in the manner and they do it, look for it. How time flies. It may seem hard to believe, but six months ago this week, our metro reported its first positive case of a new virus called COVID-19. The coronavirus is in Kansas. I only know of one patient thus far that's been positive. So far from health officials are telling us that this woman is in her 50s and somehow associated with Johnson County Community College. No one should panic over this new virus or this confirmed case. Kansas still is considered at low risk for spread of the virus. Remember, that's the governor from six months ago. She sounds a lot different now. By the way, no longer do our local media outlets breathlessly report every single case. Have we now become desensitized to the story because it's gone on for so long? But perhaps more importantly, are we safer today in our metro than we were six months ago? This week, the Nelson Gallery reopens after being closed since March. The Chiefs return to start their season with fans in the stands. Are those two high visible signs that we are better off today than we were then, Pete? Absolutely. Uh, no doubt about it. I mean, uh, w regardless of what factor you want to look at, the important factor is is uh, deaths and hospitalizations. And we are seeing a drown downtrend, certainly, on, on deaths in both of our states. Uh, there is obviously concern that cases have gone up and hospitalizations in the state of Missouri have remained steady now for a couple of months. But in terms of having a better understanding of, of who's at risk, what those risks are, and evaluating them on a, a person by person and, uh, let's say, age range by age range basis. We didn't know that back in March. We didn't have any of that information. And now we do have a lot more of that. There's still things we don't know, but we have a much better grasp on treatment and, and on who is at most risk. And we are no doubt safer than we were in mid-March because we know more. Safer today than we were back then, Dave? I did some research earlier this week. Our death rate in Kansas City was one fourth the death rate that it was in Marion County, Indiana, which includes Indianapolis, which is kind of a, a peer city. Now that may be because our hospitals are better or our health treatment is better, or it could be because we were actually more aggressive in shutting things down than other parts of the country. And if that's the case, this pressure to open back up will reveal itself pretty quickly, we'll have more deaths, and then the pressure to do something will grow again. So we are by no means, Nick, in my view, out of the woods. Are we really being more aggressive? We see school districts, including Shawnee Mission this week, reversing right? course, now allowing sports. We have the Blue Valley School District, or Blue Springs School District, suing Jackson County to allow more spectators, uh, because they, they can only have 100 at high school games. And it was only a few weeks ago, Lisa, that the mayor, Quinton Lucas himself, was saying, well, we may need need uh, to shut down bars again, potentially uh, limit again restaurant capacity. Th though that never happened, uh, is that still on the cards? I was uh, told by the mayor's office this week that, that there's no pending announcement about more closures. There is also tremendous pressure not to do that. There is a, a growing recall campaign against the mayor in opposition to a lot of these policies. I don't think that the mayor is concerned with a recall. I think he I think he's confident in in the popularity of, of his choices. But there's a growing pressure not not to make these actions. Okay, but that, can, but I, that re I, can I just bring it, Eric, yeah. for a second, Dave? But because that recall effort, though you may not say it's going anywhere, but one of the ostensible reasons behind that is the mayor Lucas's handling, Eric, of the pandemic. Uh, won't, it, regardless of what the mayor says, that, that he doesn't care about it, doesn't that have a chilling effect on his willingness to do any more business restrictions? Oh, absolutely. It's a big distraction. And, you know, I, I don't think if it makes it to the ballot, which I don't think there's grounds for it to make it to the ballot, it's a big distraction. And I believe if they don't have them already, I believe they'll have the signatures. It's not only the wearing of the masks that they have on their, their pages that they're promoting this on, but it's the closing of businesses and the economic impact that it's had on the city. So even though he might seem cool, calm, and collective on the outside, I think it's an issue for him. A year in office and they already want you out the door, that's a that's an ego blow. Now, before we meet again around this table, Kansas Governor Laura Kelly has a big decision to make. Next Tuesday, the state's emergency order expires, and by state law, 
the governor will also be able to reimpose restrictions on businesses statewide for up to 15 days. Will she, Dave? Uh, it's likely, uh, not certain. It's also likely that Republicans in the legislature will step up and there will be a bit of a battle over this. The pressure to open up is immense, but the danger from COVID has not ended. And if we open up too quickly, it's going to come back. That's what all the experts are telling. Pete. Just to bring up uh, the state of Kansas in particular, I mean, right now in the entire state, you've got 41 ventilators being used for COVID-19 patients, 164 overall. There are 1,000 ventilators available in the state of Kansas right now. 92 ICU beds are being used for COVID patients in the state right now. There are 1,000 available. So, uh, you know, the, the debate over whether or not, you know, the hospitals are going to get overwhelmed, uh, we may be not doing a great job on the mask front, but there's no evidence that that is close to happening right now. Well, some people do want to do a better job on the mask flank. Uh, consider, for instance, what's happening at the University of Missouri in Columbia. They're now requiring all students this week to wear masks outdoors, even if they're walking alone. The move comes after the university acknowledges it's had to punish more than 300 students for violating COVID-19 safety uh, rules. How is that new policy being viewed, Eric? You go back to saying, okay, you got to wear a mask even if you're by yourself outside, but you can go to the Chiefs game if you've got $500 to pay for a ticket. So I'm confused as a person, is this thing really serious or is it not serious? And I think there, there's too many mixed messages being sent with this whole project. No, I know, I know, Pete, on your radio show, this raised eyebrows for you as this mask policy, but the New York Times just said that Columbia, Missouri, was the sixth highest relative to population in terms of the number of new cases in the entire country. Well, I, I, my point is the hypocrisy of leadership at the university, which is to say, okay, if this is your concern, if you think that, you know, we can't have this case increase happening, then send the kids home for good. But the idea that, all right, we're going to now require masks outdoors when kids are playing Frisbee, as if that's what's causing this. No, it's co-eds being co-eds that's causing this to happen. And it's all behind closed doors. And all this does is make, uh, make leadership there feel like they're doing something. But no universities right now uh, have said, Dave Helling, that uh, they're going to shut it down. They're going to go virtual. The universities depend so much on tuition, uh, uh, Nick. And the idea that you would, in essence, shut down the schools and send everyone home and refund tuition is just a very, very difficult, uh, a difficult bar for them to clear. That's going to be a story for the rest of the year. The uh, state of Kansas, for the very first time this week, uh, as announced now, is naming names, the places and locations for the very first time since the pandemic of where these COVID cases are happening. Most of them, though, are the predictable names. You've got meatpacking plants. Most of them are retirement facilities, like in Johnson County, which has the highest uh, amount, and that's Del Mar Gardens in Overland Park. Were there any surprises in this list? I don't think so. I think we saw, as you said, meatpacking plants, prisons, uh, long-term care facilities. Again, a lot of these populations that are already vulnerable, uh, low, low wage workers working in tightly packed spaces, inmates that are in tightly packed spaces that aren't being given the freedom to, to stay home or to avoid it. So they're, they are at higher risk. And we're seeing once again that these vulnerable populations continue to be most affected by this. Virus. Are we better off, Pete, because we now know the names of these places? I know business groups were thinking they were being publicly shamed now by the governor as a result of this happening. I, I don't believe so, uh, Nick, because as Lisa pointed out, it's a lot of the places that we expected and some of them we already knew. Um, the nursing homes, the assisted living f facilities, the prisons, uh, the meatpacking plants. So I think to most people, uh, the locations would not be a surprise. Our friends at KCTV 5 News recently ran a report claiming if you live in Kansas City, Missouri, you have a far better chance of being murdered than dying of COVID-19. When we think about how our life has changed since the first case of COVID was reported in our metro six months ago, a sharp uptick in violent crime sticks out as an unexpected trend. It was originally thought crime would plummet with fewer people out on the streets, and it did for a short while, but how things have changed. Kansas City now reporting 138 homicides. This week, the violence continued, with six people injured after a shootout in Swope Park. What I saw last night, I thought I was looking at Baghdad, Iraq, high-powered reference. 
That spate of violence comes just a week after four people were shot outside of a Kansas City nightclub. When cases of COVID-19 go up, officials impose mask mandates and shut down businesses. What happens in Kansas City when violent crime goes up, Eric? We just read about it and keep on going. Usually there's, by now, there's a task force that they would create to address it, but the mayor, I think he's done a task force. We're waiting on a report. In the meantime, we have all these bodies. Usually, you would want the chief of police to step up and say something to reassure the public, you know, that they've got a plan on what's going on, on what to do and where these incidents are coming from. It, it is mind boggling. And I've got a couple of calls this week at the newspaper that people will still go to that nine lounge knowing that it's always a violent incident. People are saying, why would you go to Swope Park? There's always a violent incident reported there. So I don't know, Nick. I don't know what the solution is. I don't know what the plan is. We just got to do something. You're talking about the nine ultra lounge the scene yes. of the shooting uh, over the last weekend. That has been the scene of 23 shootings since the start of the year. At least one dead there also, uh, Lisa. If that's such a problem business, why is it taking so long to do anything about that? Uh, the city hasn't been able to um, to shut it down, you know, going through the permitting or, or licensing process. So at this point, point, um, closing it down, uh, at least temporarily, has, has had to be a legal issue and has gone through the courts and it has, has been incumbent on, on the landlord to, to take action to, to close down that bar. The city, so far, we just haven't seen any definitive action or successful action in, in closing it down. But when it came to COVID-19, it was much easier to shut down an entire business, Pete. Yeah, uh, no doubt about it, Nick. And then when you look at, you know, the Rick Smith factor here that should not be overlooked, I mean, there's a, there's still a push to get him out. I I don't believe it's it's a well positioned. But when you look at that group, they've kind of lost a little bit of steam here. And I think that's because they know they've got a board of commissioners uh, that overwhelmingly supports the police chief. And until someone like the mayor were to come out and say something against him publicly on that, that's not changing. When we uh, see an uptick in COVID cases, we see deaths in COVID cases, we don't say let's remove the public health director, Dave. Why has the chief in this case then been the center of the fix? If, if violent crime is going up, homicides are going up, the answer is to get rid of the police chief. Well, first of all, there are some people who will tell you that Rex Archer does need to go at the <laughs> health department, frankly. Uh, and, of course, there is an effort to recall Mayor Lucas. We talked about that already, in part because of the murder rate, when he has far less influence over that than Chief Smith has. Uh, and the police board, it's their responsibility uh, to, uh, to uh, address uh, violent crime in Kansas City. And the COVID experience, Nick, shows that if you take some steps to reduce exposure to a pathogen, that you can reduce the damage from it. Yet when it comes to gun violence, we're not willing to take any steps whatsoever. Just everybody arm up, head to the park, yeah. start blazing away. And, and, and even that uh, violent and crime session in Jefferson City, which has now correct. been going on for seven weeks, and they still correct. haven't. And no, uh, and no bills yet. So yes. the idea that we're powerless is ridiculous. We have power, we just choose not to use Eric. it. And one of the things that I think is different uh, with the chief versus the health director is that the chief is a, is, has some other issues just besides the violent crime. Police brutality, they start tearing up the plaza. He stepped to the microphone immediately. He stepped up. He reached out to the public. We're at 138 homicides. We've seen him, what, twice? So people are concerned in the black community. Is this focus on property on the plaza or within the black community and what the issues are? Um, you know, Eric might be feeling a different way, but I'm just saying what he has said publicly to, to me and to others is that uh, he spends a lot of his nights out at these events, at these places, trying to talk to people. But in the end, I mean, it's it's kind of amazing to me that we're putting more onus on a police chief than we are on individual responsibility and trying to figure out what that process looks like to make sure we have more of that happening in communities. He's on your radio show talking to you.
How many black people in Kansas City do you actually think listen to your radio show? Well, it's I, a conservative <laughs> radio show. I mean, but he's I've not seen on him KPOS on go. saying that or 107.3 okay. saying that. He's saying that on your show. He feels a lot safer being on your show, talking to your audience, than coming into the black community, talking to us on KPRS or 107.3. Well, that's why I noted other TV stations, because I've seen him say the same thing to Channel 5 and some others as well. All right. Is anyone paying attention to Kansas or Missouri? This week, the influential political news site Politico lists the eight states where the race for president will be won and lost. And if you live in Kansas or Missouri, I'm sorry, you're not on that list. The only states that count, apparently, are Arizona, Florida, Georgia, Michigan, Minnesota, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. That's the eight places that will get all the money and candidate attention, according to the Washington Insider News Source. So what does that mean for us? Does that mean we won't see President Trump or Joe Biden before Election Day? No whole-profile pro trips from Kamala Harris and Mike Pence, Ivanka Trump, and Barack Obama, Lisa? Uh, I, I think it's safe to say we're not highest on their priority list. I think both Kansas and Missouri uh, in 2016 uh, voted for Trump in wide, wide margins. Those margins may have shrunk a little bit, but I think Kansas and Missouri are still considered very safely uh, Trump states. And so, no, I don't think that we're going to be top of the list for those high, high profile visits. But four years ago, Pete, I just remember how many times the president came. We had Mike Pence, we had Donald Trump Jr., we had all these people coming into town. Our, our friend Michael Mahoney uh, told me that he, he believes that Trump will eventually end up here at some point. If he does, it's telling. If he doesn't, it's also telling. If he does, it probably means that the Republican Party thinks that Roger Marshall needs a boost in the state of Kansas. You can tie it into Governor Mike Parson on the Missouri side. You can make it a whole deal. Uh, maybe include Jake LaTurner District 2 for Kansas. If he doesn't show up, then it probably means that the party uh, feels good about Roger Marshall beating Barbara Bollier convincingly in that Kansas Senate race. And they I feel like it won't be necessary, but I do believe at least Mike Pence uh, will be showing up here in some capacity. Let's talk about that race real briefly, Dave, because I saw USA Today did a story, and I thought it was interesting. The top 10 um, Senate races to be watching, and the Kansas race wasn't even on it. And I see also Politico this week saying the National Democrats are not investing any uh, time uh, in that race at this point. So is it not as close as we think? Well, I talked with our friend Jeff Rowe yesterday, you know, the consultant who used to live in Kansas City. He said that he thinks the race will be closer than a lot of people think, but that uh, Roger Marshall will win in Kansas against Barb Boyer. As Pete points out, I think Mike Pence will come in, maybe the president, in part because they need to raise money. The president is broke. They've spent all of their cash. They may need to come to Kansas City and raise a buck or two. If either of them come here, it won't be because Missouri is competitive or Kansas at the presidential level they are spoken for. When you put a program like this together every week, we can't get to every headline making our news. What was the big story we missed? Yeah, it's frustrating, big time. Back to school in KC, plagued with computer glitches and server crashes. But as one viewer reminds us, why does the media spotlight the few disasters when most districts experience no problems at all? For many, the start of the chief season was the biggest story of the week. And for art lovers, it's the Nelson reopening finally this weekend. They started late and are now closing early. Worlds of fun shuttered until next year. And is it really possible Kansas City's haunted houses reopening next week? They say they are, but for the first time, it won't be just the monsters wearing masks. That white professor making international news for claiming to be black. Well, she's from here, Overland Park, and a former classmate of Mayor Lucas at Barstow. And Kansas bidding to be the headquarters for the nation's newest military branch. Could the Space Force be coming to KCK? Okay, Lisa, did you pick one of those stories or something completely different? I did. I think the biggest story this week is the start of Kansas City's football season and the, the Chiefs having, having fans in that stadium. I think that we'll be watching throughout this season as it continues. Can, can the season proceed COVID-free? And another big element here is how will players continue to use their platforms to bring attention to social justice issues? Um, I think that's something that we'll be watching as the season goes on. And it's, you know, it's, it's an experiment for a lot of people. It's a, it's a return to normalcy. I think it's very clear things are not normal, but um, it will be something to watch as, as we're going. Definitely the big story this week. Pete Mundo. 
Well, Nick, this Friday is the, uh, of course, 19th anniversary of September 11th, and it's not a sexy year. 19 next year will be a big one as 20, but uh, just a chance with as divided as we are right now in a key election year to, to think back of that anniversary, that moment, and how unified we were for a period of time uh, does bring back a soft feeling for many of us. So any effort we can all make as individuals uh, to get back to just a small portion of that, I think would be healthy for all of us. Eric Wesson. Blue Springs School District suing Jackson County. That's, uh, that's kind of a, so that they can play uh, high school football. And my question, I guess, when I first heard it was, who's paying for it? So taxpayers in Jackson County now are fa fighting an a issue that's basically a public safety issue. And who's paying for it from the school district side? Is that money that could be used for books or tutoring or something else rather than so that they can go outside and play football? Uh, and it's really about the number of spectators. They can currently have 100. They want more than that. More and, than and that. that's why they're suing the district. Uh, Dave Helling. Well, two things, Nick. First, I want to live long enough to see the headline Space Force coming to KCK. I think that headline in itself would really be a cap <laughs> on my career. And then second, I think Lisa has it right. People will be talking about whatever they see at the Chiefs game Thursday from the players about Black Lives Matter and social justice issues. That'll be a conversation not only in this community, but across the nation as the NFL season continues. And on that, we will say our week has been reviewed. Thank you, Lisa Rodriguez from KCUR News for checking in with us, along with Eric Wesson from The Call, Dave Helling of The Star, and 6 to 10 weekday mornings on KCMO Talk Radio, Pete Mundo. And I'm Nick Haynes from all of us here at Kansas City PBS. Keep calm and carry on. <laughs>